Okay, so for intro to FRC programming for non-programmers, we're going to look at um, what programming actually does for us and lets us accomplish with an FRC robot. Um, so what do we program? So in FRC, we're primarily programming the RoboRio. So this is where the vast majority of the code and work that we do um, for our program, we download to here and the RoboRio runs our program. Um, so it's controlling all the devices and that's what, and, uh, every, and it's running our code um, and executing everything we tell it to do. Um, so what does the program do once it's on the RoboRio? So the program tells the robot what to do. That's the most important thing. Um, if you don't have it, they can build the best robot in the world, but if you don't write a program for it, it is just going to sit there and not do anything. Um, it's important to know that the robot will only do exactly what you tell it to do and nothing else, right? If, if it's doing something else, it's likely because your instructions were incorrect, right? So just because the robot, like we can think of the robot having like a front and back, left and right. And if you have the joystick in your hand and you turn the, and you move the joystick to the left and the robot turns to the right, and that's not what you expected, it doesn't mean like the robot's doing something different. It means that whatever our instructions were, weren't correct, right? There's something in the code that's not mapped right. Left and right might be backwards or some, something else might be switched. Maybe we, maybe we think the motors are on the left and they're really on the right. There's all sorts of things that could be going wrong, but the robot's going to do what you tell it to um, basically every time. And then it's your job to fix the instructions to get it right. Um, the program responds to the joysticks and button presses of the drivers and controls all the robot's motors and um, pneumatics, which we'll talk about later, um, but any, any of the robot output. So any way that the robot's able to move, the program is able to control all of those movements. And most of the time it's able to do that while um, listening to the driver inputs on the, the game pads or joysticks. Um, during the autonomous mode, the program does all of the operation, right? The drivers and operator aren't allowed to touch the robot at all or the controls at all. So then the program is doing all of the movements. It's deciding where it's going to drive, what to shoot, launch, move, whatever it's doing in Auton is all happening based on pre-programmed instructions. So the, pr the program has complete control over that. Um, the program can also respond to sensors. Um, so there's a lot of ways that it can talk to you know, get things from its environment. We'll talk about what sensors a little bit more in depth. So sensors allow it to get feedback from the environment. So um, if, if a robot didn't have sensors, it wouldn't know anything, right? It wouldn't know how fast its wheels were spinning. It wouldn't know if they had had a game object inside of it. It wouldn't know everything, right? So you could have all these motors and a lot of teams build robots without sensors. So it is possible, right? But then you're kind of relying on your driver and operator kind of be those sensors, right? Their eyes have to see, oh, do I have a, do we have a ball inside of our robot now? Is the robot in the correct position? Are we going fast enough? All of those things have to be done by your driver and operator. And that gets a lot of work for them to do and to do well because they're really far away. They may not be able to judge it as easily. Um, so if you can use sensors, you can often do things a lot faster and a lot more precisely which helps you win matches. So that's one of the biggest things that um, program, programming can do is you can make your robot a lot more efficient as you keep making your program better. Um, programming can help you, yeah, know if an object has um, touched a button or if it's near something. So like if you're trying to bring a ball or game object into your robot, you can see if it's touched something or if it's maybe crossed like a beam, um, any of those types of things you can detect. Um, you can also detect the position of like a robot of a part of your robot. So if you have um, an arm or an elevator, you can detect how high it is or how far it's moved. Those are very, very useful. Um, we'll talk more about like the specifics of sensors at a later date. We don't need to go into that right now, but all you really need to know is sensors help you know what's happening and getting like actual feedback and knowing that that's real, right? The robot might know, oh, I told the elevator to move up, but it doesn't actually know if the elevator is moving up. Maybe the motor got disconnected. The sensors can tell you, oh no, the motor is actually moving up. We're reading this back and seeing that the motor is moving up. Um, there are some kind of like 
this is roughly hierarchy of what we would want to do with our programming. So when we're just starting out, um, the most important thing is to be able to get basic driving and controls done, right? If you can do everything else, but when the driver picks up the gamepad, if they're not able to move a joystick or hit buttons and have the robot actually move around, you're not going to do very well in the matches. It's really hard to do a completely autonomous robot or something. You really want to get your basic driving and controls done. Um, and they're not too complicated with one of the first things we'll work on um, next week when we start doing some example programs. Um, but that's really what we want to get started is how do you get, how do you kind of get that gamepad feedback or joystick feedback and map it to different outputs on the robot and have it do what we want it to. Um, then the program can also do basic autonomous. So we can have um, really simple actions. Like maybe we want the robot to drive forward for three seconds. Um, some of the time the you'll get points if autonomously you can move off of a certain line or move out of a certain space or area on the field. So if you just want to have it drive for a certain amount of time, that's something you can do really quickly in Auton. Um, maybe you have the robot um, spin up a certain wheel and then fire a single ball or launch a single ball or something. Um, those types of basic things are things you can do in Auton really easily without a lot of knowledge or testing or anything. You can kind of just get it close and it'll do what it needs. It'll, it'll work. Um, you don't have to have any complicated sensors. You don't have to have anything like that. Um, sensor feedback, like we've already said, is really important. Um, and that's why we also, when we're doing the mechanical design, we have to integrate those sensors and we have to know what sensors do we actually want on a system. If we build a whole robot and it has a, it has a nice arm that moves up and down, but we didn't plan for a way to know where the arm is, it gets a lot harder to add all that back in to like add a sensor to tell us, okay, the arm's at the top or the arm's at the bottom. Uh, during our mechanical design, we want to know, okay, what sensors do we need? Where are they going to be located? How do we mount them? Um, so that's one of the things to really think about on, if you're not going to help with all the programming, it's still really important to know this side of it. Um, Advanced controls get more interesting. So instead of just like directly mapping maybe how far a joystick moved to how fast a motor goes, you can do a lot more interesting things to help your, to help the driver and operator be better and faster with the robot. Um, so you can have the robot move certain parts to different positions. So instead of having to like have a joystick where you tell um, how fast an arm motor should move, maybe you have a button that says move all the way to the top. And then it just has to, you click the button, it goes all the way up. And then you don't have to, um, you know, they don't have to be actually like watching it at all. They don't have to control it. Um, the robot handles the actual action and the driver operator just gives it the command they want it to do. Um, that's a lot easier for everyone. It's going to be faster. It's going to be more reliable. The robot's going to score more points um, and hopefully win more matches and win more events. Um, after that, we start getting into advanced autonomous controls. So then instead of just having the robot maybe drive for a certain amount of time, you start getting a lot, you get more advanced to where you have it drive for um, certain paths around the field, right? So you could have much more complex driving maneuvers. Um, it's doing more actions with um, the game pieces. Maybe it's picking up game pieces, launching multiple game pieces. It's doing a lot more things. Um, than just like driving for a certain amount of time or launching a single ball or anything like that. Um, okay, so programming is largely logic. So what we mean by logic here is basically checking if something is true or false. Um, and there's like a definitive answer for that, right? So um, statements that make a lot of sense in programming, which we briefly touched on last week where we talked about if and then statements, but things like if the, the A button is pressed, then turn on the intake motor. So those types of, that type of logic basically checking is A pressed or not, and then acting based on that is a lot of what we're doing in our robot programming. Um, um, some housekeeping stuff. So we had a couple of people ask questions about this and we've had other teams ask as well. So I'll cover it in here. Um, we use Java, which we already did at the last one and kind of introduced. Um, there are other options in FRC, but for a variety of reasons, Spectrum uses Java. Um, 
One of them is that the majority of SRT, FRC teams other than us also use Java. Um, I don't know the exact percentage right now. It kind of changes based on the year. Um, but it's, it is the vast majority and a lot of the best teams in the world use Java. So that makes it a lot easier for um, us to get help or to use, like see examples of their code and use parts of it in our code really simply. Um, but it also by having more people on our team know Java, if more of the other teams are, we can help a lot more teams by us choosing to continue to use Java, right? If we do something else and then when we released our code or we release some helpful guide, it's going to be way less impactful if only a handful of teams are using the same programming language as us. Um, where we're, while we're using Java and so are thousands of other teams, anything we do and anything we can help helps a lot more teams that way. Um, there are a lot of public examples of FRC Java programs, which is really useful. Um, a bunch of teams post all of their code, so you can go through and look at it, read it, um, see what they did, use examples from it to make our code better. Um, AP Computer Science is taught in Java, which is helpful. So either for people who join the team, either having the class right now or having taken it before or taking it after, some way it'll either help you or help the team by having those be the same language. Um, it's pretty easy to have multiple people working on the same program. Um, we'll talk about that um, in a little bit in um, training C2.0 when we install some of our software. Um, but one of our software tools allows us to have to basically sync our code together with everybody who's working on it across the team. Um, and that makes it really useful. There's a couple programming programs that that's a little bit harder. Um, another big reason is we've just been using it since the team was founded. So we have a lot of stuff that we've already written, that we've built, that we've wrote out and tested and kind of know how to use and do well. Um, so if we were to switch, we would lose all of that, right? We'd have to recreate a bunch of work that we've already been doing for the last nine years now. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to talk about how to actually get this all installed on your computer um, is WPI lib. So WPI lib is the basically the way to get um, all the FRC robots kind of acting in similar ways. Um, if we didn't have FR at WPI lib, all of us would have to like write our own code to control to talk to each motor controller, um, to get the feedback from a joystick and everything. We'd have to figure out exactly how to tell the computer to do all of those like very specific things. And that would take up a ton of our time every season if we had to rewrite all of that. Um, so instead, WPI lib exists to give us um, a lot of pre-written, known, tested, good code to do a lot of those tasks. And then we're just kind of putting them in the right order and using them to do what we need it to do on our specific robot. Um, so it contains all the code to communicate to the driver station. So that's how it gets like the joystick and gamepad inputs and outputs back. Um, it also has all the code to do um, enable and disable. So from, from the driver station, you can start the robot in the enable mode so that the joysticks will actually do things. You can also disable it so then the gamepad and joysticks won't do anything and we can keep everything safe. Um, all the different modes during the match as well. So like autonomous and driver control, it has all of the code kind of built in to do all of that. So we're not having to rethink of how that works and make sure it works the actual field. All of that's the same across most robots. Um, it also contains a lot of the code for performing most of the basic robot functions. So talking to a motor controller to tell it to go forward and backwards, um, checking with sensors, all of those types of things are already written for us. So we're not creating all of that. And instead we get to use them to solve the problems and make our robot better. Um, it contains a lot of other code that's a little bit more advanced too. So they've started adding a lot more things over the last few years. So there are ways that you can use pre-built methods and pre-things and, and stuff that it's already concluded in WPI lib so that we're not rewriting a ton of stuff. They've already written it, they've tested it, and then we can just choose to use it. Um, don't take this to mean that it's gonna like write our program for us or that we don't have to actually program. We absolutely do. They just take it a lot of like the low level stuff, the stuff that's a little bit, um, that can be very shared between all of the robots. That's super common. Um, and made that already done for us. So we get to do a lot more fun and interesting things by using all of those pieces. Uh, learning what is all included in WPI lib and learning how to use it is really useful. 
Um, it's one of the most important things about FRC programming. It's also one of the things that dramatically changes like why FRC programming is different than just being like good at Java or anything, right? Um, even if we had somebody come in and says, I've been a Java developer for years and I work at so-and-so company, whatever, if they've never actually done it with a robot, it's gonna be a very different thing and they'll have to learn all the same things that you all are learning right now um, because the library is completely different. Doing it with an actual robot is very different than writing software um, or an app for a phone or anything like that. Um, a couple of quick examples of where programming has really helped us. So um, a simple example is in 2019, our elevator, um, there were multiple scoring locations. So you had all of these different scoring locations that you had to be able to raise up and down to. Um, so instead of having to have just like a joystick where you could control the motor forward or backwards, and then you'd have to like every time try to get the motor to stop at exactly the right point, which would be really tricky for the operator to do, we had it set up to where there was a sensor on the elevator so we could tell um, how far the elevator was up or down. And then we programmed different buttons so that when they hit a specific button, it would go to the correct spot automatically. And then we could just drive in and score. Um, so we weren't worried about um, exactly when to stop it or anything like that. It would handle all of that for us. Our operators and drivers could get the commands that they needed to be really fast and efficient and score a lot of game pieces. Um, another example in this past year, our um, our ball launcher had a um, had the limelight vision sensor at the front of our robot, so it could track the goal, so it could see where the actual goal opening was. So as soon as our as soon as we were ready to aim and ready to fire, um, we could hit a single button. The robot would turn and lock onto the goal, and then our ball launcher would figure out how far away we were, and it could spin up to the right speed for us to launch the ball and have it land in the goal. Um, so a lot of those things can be, um, they just make everything a lot more precise and a lot more efficient compared to just trying to do everything, just mapping the controls directly to motor outputs. You don't get very far just doing that. So you have to start doing some of the advanced stuff to get really efficient and score a lot of points during the match. Uh, 